Ah, hi, Nirva. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on uh, on Facebook today. Um, namaste to everybody who's out there and uh, uh, are watching from the Godarmic community and appreciate everybody for taking the time again to join us. I'm, I'm really pleased to have Nirva Patel with us uh, today. Uh, Nirva, uh, just researching about your background and the work that you've done um, for animal rights and, and what you've been involved in. I think you, you're a crucial person for the work that we do at Godarmic to be able to highlight the importance of animal farming, animal welfare, animal agriculture in a whole host of different topic areas. And, 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 I, and I'd love to explore that with you today uh, and get your, your feedback and, and thoughts and ideas and inspiration for, for our community as well as for, for people outside. Um, so, so thanks for taking the time. I know that you know time zone stuff in the middle of children uh, picking up, but I think it was uh, really important and uh, really appreciate that. Of so, course, welcome. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, Nirva, before we get into you know things like game changers and all the amazing work you've done from an uh, academic perspective, and um, the, the area that I'm really interested in is. Uh, that, that, that's um, been really important to me personally is Dharma and uh, the idea of Ahimsa and Jainism um, and Hinduism and all the isms that may root from the ideas of compassion and love and nonviolence that, that we really uh, seek at the core. Where does your inspiration come from in this regard and, and what are your thoughts? Where, where have you leaned inspiration from? Sure. Thank you. Um, well, it's so nice to be here and thank you for having me. Um, you're, you're onto great things and you're starting a movement and you'll accomplish wonderful things for this planet. Um, when we talk about Dharma, we talk about duty and we talk about, we should never talk about duty alone. We have to talk about duty with Ahimsa. And there's, you know, the phrase that um, we always heard growing up as in the Jain community, Ahimsa Parmo Dharma which means that um, you know, nonviolence is the ultimate duty. Um, so I grew up with that philosophy. I, I, looking back on that, um, you know, I feel very fortunate that I was raised Jane and you know, eating meat was never even a thing. Um, it was just not even considered because we value all life and nonviolence is really the, the basic tenant and, and everything kind of stems from that. Um, so it's great to now later in my life incorporate that philosophy in my education, in uh, raising my children, in advocating for, uh, for beings that can't advocate for themselves. I think that's a really powerful statement and, and it's something that perhaps not from Jainism that I've uh, seen, but uh, obviously I understand and most people who understand what Jainism is will understand that there's a clear adherence to Ahimsa, ahimsa Parma Dharma, and the idea of Ahimsa being so important uh, within Jainism, but also in the Mahabharata and in ancient uh, Hindu texts, you will find great references to, to similar ideas and concepts. And, and it's something that we've drawn up, drawn on in Godaramic as well to see that, you know, where are those voices for nonviolence within a great book of war? Um, right. Right. highlighting that so I, I think it's you know if we look deep enough in any tradition we can find nonviolence as a as a really beautiful um concept which is the root of love uh i think nonviolence is an expression of love right. and um and, and uh, also kind of following oh sorry sorry to break sorry, down, go ahead, please. Also following those instincts you had as a child you know it's it's not only just observing that um, you know something is suffering or an animal or a person is suffering but also feeling that suffering too as you observe that so I think that that is all intertwined into compassion um, or ahimsa ahimsa is compassion and empathy so it's it's going back to those original feelings of love and compassion as you mentioned and you're right in every single religion they talk about treating people better and leading a more compassionate lifestyle but 
we, we kind of have to be careful not to then carve out exclusions to that compassion. Um, and so, so that is, I think, where we are today as a world where we've suffered so much from, from exploiting animals, which is kind of you know, justified in so many ways by our society, but the penalty is too large. And we're, we finally, I mean, you know, we're experiencing it today. So that there's a window of opportunity to have these conversations. And I'm glad you're doing it at Godarmic. Yeah, I, I appreciate those words. And I think, um, as you said, all traditions have the root of this kindness or people who have expressed it, whether it's in Christianity with Martin Luther King, or uh, even though they may not have followed it in animal agriculture, the importance of nonviolence. Uh, I really believe that nonviolence is the highest dharma in the sense that it, it can solve nearly every one of our problems if we yeah. apply nonviolence to it, whether it's a political situation, whether it's the farmer's situation in Northern India, whether it's uh, a, a, co a combative political situation that's occurring or with animal agriculture. If we keep nonviolence as a principle and then apply it to any problem, normally we will get a better solution. So uh, I don't know what your thoughts are about that uh, in the world today. Do you think nonviolence is considered? Do people uh, politically or in education capacity think about nonviolence as a high minded principle of life? I think they do, you know, I think that it's just who thinks about it, right? Like, I think that the people who are suffering, you know, for example, the expose on factory farms, um, you know, and slaughterhouses that this COVID pandemic has brought to attention has shown a lot of human suffering. And I know that it's on the minds of, of people, um, but is it on the minds of these large producers like Tyson's and, and you know, companies that are so focused on the commercial aspects of productivity that there, you know, human suffering is just, it's only an issue if the people there have a voice to bring it up. And I think right. that now um, it's happening because we have, we have this like magnifying glass on all of these processes that make up our world. Um, and it's really sad because animals, you know, that's the obvious, th those are the obvious beings that are tortured and every single day for our food system. But we're not always thinking about the humans that are also, um, you know, in slaughterhouses, there are humans in many cases have to wear diapers because the speed lines of the animals going through those tracks are so fast that there is not enough time to go to the bathroom. So if you think about that aspect of suffering, which is not often, those stories are not often told, it, just imagine how much else we're not covering. Um, but yeah, I, I do believe that it is on people's minds. It's just, what are they gonna do about it? You know, if they them personally are not suffering. Um, so it's extending your circle, extending your circle of friends, of family, of, of humanity. And if you do that, then you can't ignore it. And I think that's the core idea as well, isn't it? Extending your circle so that all living beings are part of our family, uh, that, uh, that we can love all, like one of the main slogans we use as an organization is love all, feed all. Uh, whether we're distributing uh, uh, food to homeless people, or, you know, vegan meals uh, at a festival, we will always, you know, never turn anybody away who wants uh, a meal or, uh, and anybody can have uh, food. Uh, and serving food is so, such an important and integral part to the work that we do. Um, but it wasn't something that, you know, we did meals for, for the sake of distributing love and distributing compassion for helping the homeless. We didn't really, and I, this is something that I, I kind of didn't really consider deeply enough, the idea of food as a way of educating people about poverty, the environment, um, all of the associated issues, like, you know, probably 50% of our whole system is around food. Uh, the, when we're talking about global emissions, whether it's transporting food or from animal agriculture, everything all together is such a large focus around food. And, and we've distributed more than 4 million meals. But today, we didn't really consider how important that food or food was for educating people about uh, non-violence, about educating people about the environment. What you, you've uh, been executive producer of Game Changers, which was you know an incredible documentary that you know I read that was perhaps one of the most seen documentaries in history, if not the most. Um, 
that's an incredible achievement of taking an idea and then you know reaching a mass audience with it and actually making uh real change i, I mean i remember in the city where i was working 12 13 years ago when i ordered a pizza and it didn't have cheese on it so i ordered a pizza i was in a, a, a meeting and and i ordered a in a pizza restaurant and people thought I was you know, an alien for thinking like that. But today, veganism is uh, you know, a well understood global movement um, that people really get. Things like Game Changers has, has played a huge role in that. Yep. What's the story behind that and how did that all come about? Yeah, so when you think about your circle and you know, I, I think there's this philosophy that I follow you know, I know I'm different. I, I'm, I'm probably the only vegan person I know within a 10 mile radius of, of my home. And, um, and it's hard. You don't want to go out there and, and constantly have these conversations. I mean, you, you start like finding yourself like not being invited to parties anymore because people just don't want to deal with the vegan rhetoric. So what I, what I kind of believe in is um, be really strong, be a pillar, be who you are. And if someone, you know, do your advocacy, as long as it's not offensive. Um, and if people come to you, then great, have those conversations, do your best, but, but be internally very strong. And it's, it's kind of more of an introspective approach, but everyone around me knows that I'm plant-based, I'm, I'm vegan, I'm, I'm an animal advocate, I, I care so much about this cause. And my twin sister, was actually at a film festival and she was, um, you know, they were viewing the screening of the Game Changers there. And she was like, oh my God, Nirva, you won't believe who I just met. I just met the chief scientific officer for the Game Changers. Remember that movie you were mentioning? And, and so she contacted me and I contacted them. And I was like, I just wanna see the film. I wanna see what you have created. Like I, there was a lot of buzz in the vegan community about this film, um, but the prior efforts to, 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 to produce a documentary film, um, you know, they've, they're, they, they're great. Like everything is data driven. A lot of it is based on the China study, um, but a lot of these films are difficult to watch. Um, they're, they can feel a little accusatory. They can feel too intense. You know, they have footage of slaughterhouses. And so, I, but I heard that the game changers was different because it was positive and it was about these athletes. And so I, I contacted them and I said, let me just, can I do you mind? I'm just an, an advocate and I'm so passionate and I just wanna, I just wanna see the film. So the producers were amazing. I mean, it's a James Cameron film. It's a star studded executive production team. And I saw the film and I remember, um, I think I was with my dad who was visiting at the moment and he's the one who you know had so much of the Jane philosophy that came towards me. And we both just started crying. Like it was, it was so incredibly powerful, not because of just the storyline, but because I knew this would work. I knew this would be viewed by the world in a different way than everything before. And I felt like it was just this complete piece that focused on what is really important to people, which is health. You know, um, you know, there they say there are three pillars to animal advocacy, there's the environment, there's health, and there's just pure compassion for those poor animals. And for some people, it's just health. And this film focused on these incredible athletes, like, you know, you had Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger talking, and then it was, you know, uh, Djokovic and Serena Williams are also executive producers. And you hear about these strongman competitions and Oh, it's just so fantastic. And I think pe that resonated with people because we all want to do better. We want to be athletes, but we think meat is associated with, with fitness and also masculinity. So, so this, this was like a debunk film and it was just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that the world now owns it and it's talked about a lot and people have actually changed their habits, their diets, and they have this incredible team of believers of the plant-based movement that back them up, you know, like if Serena Williams does it, why can't I? If Djokovic is killing it out there on a plant-based diet, why can't I? Um, so that's, that's the story of the Game Changers. And I'm, you know, very pleased. The producers are incredible people. They, let's see what they do next, um, you know, but it's been a fantastic experience for me. Amazing, amazing. No, it's really incredible. And, and two big takeaways, what I take from what you've just shared there and from having, having watched it was, um, one is that 
like you mentioned, it's positive advocacy. It's uh, very different from, you know, accusatory uh, behavior or, you know, uh, being holier than thou mentality and, you know, uh, sharing that kind of, a, um, you know, putting people down or speaking that way. It's not, it, it wasn't any way like that. And I think that's something we've tried to do with our work with Godarmic as well, is to try to be always positive, always be sharing positive messages, nothing negative. I mean, in nine and a half years of our content, our material, our work, everything has had positive connotations and to create only love and compassion vibrations, nothing that can uh, uh, be kind of deemed to be you know, anti this community or uh, uh, negative towards even anybody who we think you know, is doing something wrong, we will approach it in a, in a positive way. And I think Game Changers did that brilliantly. The second thing I think is great, like you mentioned, there's those three pillars. I think also giving people utilitarian, um, the ability to decide on something that's good for them, uh, that they will benefit from first, uh, like their own health. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think maybe we don't focus enough on us or right. the person, uh, you know, what does it do to me directly? I know that those animals are suffering. I know that those people uh, are not earning enough to live uh, or there's people sleeping in the snow, uh, homeless. And, and but what does that do to me as a person? And I think by solving a problem and speaking directly to an individual about their own health um, right. first is such a is such an important thing. Uh, I mean, we, we don't do that very much. And, and it's something we could learn. What, what could we learn as advocacy? advocacy uh, workers and uh, social activists and uh, people in community you know day in day out in the field feeding the homeless or working w what with that kind of success and with that uh, uh, mood of uh, work what, what could we learn as a, as volunteers and as a voluntary organization yeah um, well you know you touched upon the connection to the human self right like if we feel that we're invested if if veganism is successful and thereby we are successful as human beings, you have that causal link. And I think that, you know, for, for, for many people, you have to find what that link is. And for me, I think the link for me was when I became a mom and, you know, I'm feeding my children and I'm like measuring every drop of milk that I'm like giving my babies. And, and it's, it's just, it's this whole process where you're like, gosh, this is a lot of work and this is really intense. And then you think about those cows in the dairy industry and you think about how many of them don't meet their babies. They have, um, you know, like a, a nine month gestation period similar to humans. They cry for five days when the babies are taken away. And I think there's like that missing piece that people aren't told. And I don't know if I'm answering your question about your, the, you know, the community, but I think if you can storytelling, you know, I think as, a, as an organization, if right. you figure out these incredible, impactful stories and you reach, you will reach your audience with these memorable things that they can't ignore and they can personally relate to and then take action. Um, so if you're a woman or a mom, you know, it's just the plight of that poor dairy cow. If you're, if you're, a, a, you know, a child, it's, it's the baby chicks that are crushed alive in the egg industry. If you, I mean, th there's so many parallels that you could draw upon as an organization to reach your audience and to, you know, make them not only look at animals as food animals and, and products, but as these suffering beings, you know? And, and I think also the fact that you're feeding people and you're, you know, you're helping the homeless, your message should be that regardless of what your philosophy is, you can't deny that you can live a great life on a plant-based diet. Like above all of that, you can't ignore that you can live really well. You know, like the, all these deficiencies like B12 and vitamin D, most of the people who are deficient in vitamin D are not vegans. <laughs> they're like, they eat other diets too. It's not like this, there are a lot of myths that need to, you, you, you should maybe help overcome because I think you'll be able to engage more of your community um, when you do so because people are what trying do you to think find are those 
Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I was just thinking that when you said that, what are those big uh, myths? Like, what do you think are some of the key myths? Right, so one is this whole like, um, you know, meat is muscle and the game changers took care of that. So <laughs> done, sure. check. Um, the other one is, like I said, vitamin D. You know, I, you, I, I have, you know, I, I think that I, there's actually a physician, her name is Reshma Shah and I recommend her book. She, she just published it, it's called Nourish. And she, um, I spoke to her on the phone and she said, you know, there are people who are vitamin B12 deficient and D deficient, but of those patients, they're not vegans. You know, they're, or they could be, but it's, it's just this kind of excuse. So I think that's one thing. The B12, I have never personally been deficient on B12. Um, and, you know, I, I really, I think you can just take a supplement and you should be fine. And even if you do eat meat, you should still take a B12 supplement. Um, <sighs> See, other okay. Um, I don't know if this is a myth, but there's this excuse that um, you know humans are naturally naturally meat eaters, and the game changers talked about this a little bit when they studied um, teeth, and they also studied um, you know old civilizations, and they looked at where they were you know the remains of these civilizations. And of course, the fruits and vegetables that they all probably ate decomposed like many, many years ago, and the bones are probably still there, which which doesn't mean that you have, you know, you were this um, carnivorous species back then. Um, let me think about the other myths. Yeah, I mean, if I think, I think there are probably a million out there, but um, you know, if you if you're a research based person and someone who wants to acquire information, you'll find yourself to always go towards that plant-based diet. But if you're someone who wants to stick to the status quo and to the way things have always been, you'll find an excuse to suit the way you live your life. And sure, unfortunately, sure. as you get yeah, older- I, I completely agree. And, and I think you know one of the things we've tried to do is we have a campaign called Go Plant-Based, where we are encouraging people to take a personal pledge to be vegan, to take that pledge uh, yeah. and to take that step. and. Uh, and it's just direct that, you know, what, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I thought of one myth, one more myth, a very important one to your organization too. People think that plant-based is expensive. Like it is just oh, those Beyond Meat burgers and that fancy tofu, it's not. Especially when you come from a thermic philosophy and you've been plant-based your whole life eating lentils right. and rice, which are a perfect equivalent to meat. And I mean, you could live off of a very small budget a month and be perfectly satisfied with your food but if you're you know if you're going to buy right. like 12 dollars beyond meat burger at the restaurant then of course it's going to be expensive but well, that's, that's how we've been able to distribute so many meals and people are shocked like you know how does a, such a small organization with low fundraising capacity do this much meal distribution and it's because we create meals which are things like lentils or dal and rice and yeah. uh, with some vegetables mixed in one pot meals which are uh, I'll tell you something that, you know, we worked with the Department of Food and Agriculture here in the UK, and we received a grant to feed people during the COVID pandemic because food supplies were really uh, struck and difficult for many homeless people and many people struggling uh, uh, because, uh, you know, think places were closed, there were not the access points, the councils were all shut, everything got closed down. So they used charities like us. And when we received the grant, there was an allowance to feed people for up to probably the equivalent of uh, three and a half dollars per meal uh, mm -hmm. per person. And we felt that that was really high, you know, because when we <laughs> produce food, we produce a huge pot of rice, a huge pot of dal, some vegetables, and we could probably get it down to, you know, 50 cents, the equivalent of 50 cents per person. And if, if we can, and I think even more than that, like, you know, if you get big enough pots and you cook on scale and you get those kind of ingredients, food costs very low. Like, you know, pe people at the moment and especially uh, economically disadvantaged people pay way too much for their food. They pay right. the most. Um, they pay the most. Um, yeah. And the food that they, that's, that's of like, you know, our federal subsidies are a mess. We, we give, I think, $20 billion to the meat and dairy industry. And, you know, a lot of that goes to the feed for the animals um, that we then eat. So we're actually feeding, you know, it, it's for corn subsidies. And I mean, the plant part of that is for corn subsidies and wheat and, and soybeans and all that. The meat and dairy a lot of those subsidies, especially the SNAP program, I, I wrote a whole report on where does that actually go? If you trace it all the way down, 
it's, you know, you'd be surprised how much you can buy at a convenience store or at like at a gas station that qualifies mm -hmm. for SNAP, you know, for the, the food assistance program in America. It, it's, you're keeping people sick. Um, you know, you don't ha like, it's very hard to get a nice, um, you know, like a just egg or, or like if, if you're trying to transition to a better diet and you want to eat a Beyond Meat burger or a just egg or one of these other pro transition products in my mind, you can't. So you're just gonna do what's easy and convenient. And if you're, you're a single mother working five, seven days a week, you're not gonna have the time to go and source your, go to the farmer's market and see if a, a, a food stamp works there. The system mm -hmm. is just so, it's just awful. No, that, that definitely is a, a difficult, uh, but I think at the same time, uh, if we can create places where, um, like for example, temples, gurdwaras, uh, Jain temples, Hindu temples, th those places produce this mass meal already, um, which is very cheap and very um, low cost. And, uh, and uh, as they distribute, like we do all our food distribution on the streets, I really feel that now education is important through those meals. So perhaps even asking people, how much do you think this meal actually costs? To produce or you know it's here we can produce this thing and slowly but surely many families that we we've been supporting actually been going away and cooking with their uh, children and using the activity or, or we've never used lens but when the pandemic happened here in the uk bread disappeared pasta disappeared and toilet roll disappeared uh, but lentils were in abundance <laughs> rice was in abundance Right. Uh, chickpeas are in abundance and, you know those things were still on the shelves and yeah. uh, and they were cheap and and you can buy them to store and they will last a, a long time as well so I, I think it clearly showed that in the western diet there is a lack of understanding about beans and lentils and utilizing that uh, in, in a greater capacity so maybe you know that's an area where we can actually be uh, active and you know uh, share an understanding but I I did read a bit about you, you um, worked with Jane Temples to try and reduce dairy consumption and, uh, and, uh, and create understanding about that. What, what, what happened there? What, what was the idea behind that? Yeah, um, I was really, you know, there's this time of the year for, um, for Jane's called uh, Puryushana, and that's like our most holy time. And um, I, Aside from just that, it's like one week at the end at the end of August where you fast, and I've been doing that as a kid. Um, but what I was really horrified by was that, while the Jane, you know, and it's not everyone in the Jane community, it's just um, you know a few, a lot of people, um, they believe in ahimsa, they believe in nonviolence, but um, they still support the dairy industry because of references to old texts that the, you know, the gurus, they, they ate ghee and they consumed you know, dairy and they had, but I think the distinction is that you know, small farms back in India, you know, where the water buffalo was like a pet that had a name that was loved, that lived out its life on the farm is a lot different than what you see today in a factory farm where an animal is artificially inseminated um, multiple times throughout her life um, and has to give up those cat the baby cows constantly and um, because she won't have milk until she it's unless a different she's world, isn't it? completely yeah, no, different world it's a different world right and so that milk and it, you know in india it's getting it's 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 like it's, it's becoming more productive. So that whole concept of those small farms with the water buffalo is not no longer really there anymore. Um, no. So I had a problem with um, when we did these pujas and rituals at the Jain centers that they were using ghee in um, some of the rituals and the, the ceremonies. And I had go, I'd visited a Jain temple in Burlington and I saw a huge dabba, like a huge container of, of amal ghee. And I was like, <laughs> You know, I think they know like, because the, there are many people in the community, all of the leaders actually, um, Chitra Banu and Pramoda Ben and all of these, these, they've been vegan for years, but people find it so hard to give up ghee and even chai is like really hard to give up. So they continue these practices and think it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. So I started a petition and um, I emailed everyone I knew and I wrote up a whole, it was just like a grassroots effort, but 
I went back to that temple uh, a couple of weeks later and the ghee was gone. And they, they had little um, electric uh, battery operated candles uh, for the rituals instead. And then I made some phone calls for other Jain centers and they had all done the same thing. I mean, I'm sure there's some, some that still use ghee, but no one actually got back to me. Um, no one responded to my emails, but they heard me. <laughs> they heard me and they changed the practices at the temple. So, um, so that was my, my dairy campaign. That's really interesting. Uh, yeah. I, I had a, a very similar experience um, about 10 years ago when we actually first started Go Dharma. The first campaign was a campaign called Go Organic. And it's yeah. about trying to raise awareness about organic farming and the difference between non-organic and organic. So, you know, it was at a time where we in the UK started to import the idea of factory farms from the US. Uh, mm. And the first big... Uh, um, mass dairy farms were being uh, planned and permissions, you, you know, uh, being planned. And, and at that time, I had just, um, you know, a few years before transitioned from a meat eating diet to vegetarian. I grew up as a, uh, a meat eating person and, and I transitioned at that time and was questioning everything around vegetarian diets. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, understood and then saw these. Uh, applications going in for mass uh, uh, factory farms in the UK, which was not something that you know was common practice. So we launched a campaign and worked with organic farming, uh, organic farmers, to kind of really understand their plight and their challenges and their differences. Um, and we we explored as well, like you know, as you said, those small hold farms. Like, is it possible to produce a more non-violent dairy in the West? Is there a way of uh, small hold farms? And you know, after probably eighteen months to two years of working with farmers, calculating economic numbers, and in the UK, and probably I can you know for sure say that it's a similar case in in the US. Milk costs are cheaper sometimes than a bottle of water, um, and and that is a very difficult. Uh, predicament for people to deal with why is the milk cheaper than the water um and it's because the animal pays the cost it's because the cows pay the cost the, the dairy the, the dairy cows pay the cost the, the male ca calves lose their life immediately and pay the cost so all of this uh uh low cost dairy is actually funded um by the suffering uh, that's produced on a mass scale, uh, and uh, we we found that really difficult to deal with. And and India is now like you know coming from traditions that find their roots in India is moving in a similar way. If not, it's already there. Um, when we I, I've travelled extensively across India, and with the tradition of Krishna and uh, cows and love of you know looking after cows in such a beautiful way, just as how. Uh, there's such a wonderful relationship with cats and dogs here in the West. Uh, there's a similar love for, for cows in India. And I think that when we visit the Goshalas, the, the cow sanctuaries, there are no bulls there, or there are very few. You might find five to a hundred. So where are and, they? <laughs> and when you ask the question, where are they? You, you know, even though it might be run by a religious organization, or it could be run by a a charity organization is a difficult answer and they they can't answer you they can say oh it's on another farm or it's gone for a, you know they're walking around or they get looked after there is no real answer mm -hmm. and i think that's a a truth that people need to face up to um yeah. and it's a difficult truth it um, is and i remember a lot of my fr i lived in india for eight years and i had oh. a lot of friends who um you know, who were like, oh no, I go to Ahimsa farms and I'm telling you, Nirva, the animals are treated really well. They all have a name. And I was like, well, okay. But if the mom is, you know, producing milk, um, how is she able to do that year after year after year? And where does the baby go? I mean, this, this, this area, this farm would have like thousands and thousands of cows. And then they would say, well, they, they kind of, they go to different sanctuaries, they get sold, something happens to them. Well, they get slaughtered. You know, the babies get slaughtered. They, they, it's just an inevitable reality um, of even Ahimsa farms. So mm, I that agree. connection I agree. Rule is there, and you can't get beyond that. And it just, I think it plays with how many doors you want to open up. Um, and for me, I want to open up all the doors. I want to know 
Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't argue against myself. So I also gave up milk. Yeah, and, and I think that's the important work today is to apply ancient principles like nonviolence to modern circumstances and, and to see them for what they are and then you know carefully think about that. I think there's a really important uh, Gita verse which says, this is the wisdom. Now you do as you think is best. You act upon this knowledge. In, in, in a... and, and, and that's where cellular agriculture is going to be really interesting, right? Because, and you, I'm sure you know all about cell ag, but it's basically like lab-based meat, right? You can have the exact same burger as you, as you could get with an animal that has been tortured and killed and, and suffered. Will people pick the cell ag burger? You know, if they don't think it's like a Franken food or something weird, if they're over that, and they have two equivalent burger choices at a restaurant, which one will they pick? And if you do pick the one that involved all the suffering, are human sadists? Like is, is suffering involved in, in all of our pleasure too? And that's a door I'm afraid to open about humanity. Um, but I don't think it will be. I think <laughs> I'm hoping that people will embrace the burger because people love the taste of meat. They, they've been raised that way. They've, they've been kind of addicted to it for years. It's very hard to give up. But if you could, you know, I, we'll see what happens with humans. I, I don't know, but um, you know, I always wonder: is suffering an essential part of the pleasure? I don't know. Potentially, it could be. I mean, I think, yeah, I think uh, that's an interesting area, um, and probably above my head, to be honest, in terms of uh, my uh, simpleton understanding. But uh, it doesn't naturally, like my initial instinct, doesn't say that I would, you know. I, I wouldn't like to go near that because I just want to stick to plants and have as little noise in the food as possible anyway. So, you know, the simpler, uh, uh, the closer to basic uh, digestible, like you know, what China study tells us already or what Game Changers explained, we don't need to necessarily expand beyond what's already a simple uh, right. solution. Like we're, create, we're solutionizing for what doesn't actually need to be Right. Uh, no, it's a lot of work to justify meat. It's a lot of work to even create meat and to take care of the workers and take care of the animals and the antibiotics and the packaging and, you know, mailing chicks over. And the whole thing is just like a huge process when you can just eat plants <laughs> and it's just so yeah. easy. <laughs> mm. And I, I think as well, coming back to uh, what we said about the temples in India, the Goshalas and, and the situation around uh, that, why is it do you think that you know a lot of people will still advocate for not eating things like garlic and onions and you, you, you know uh, uh, yeah. root vegetables or something, but they are blind to the reality of the suffering of dairy? Yeah. Is it uh, you, you know it's I've always found this a difficult uh, application of nonviolence in that. It's absolutely ridiculous, you know. And as a Jane, I can say that it's it's absolutely ridiculous that you're you're justifying the consumption of butter and milk and ghee, but you're saying no to garlic and no to all of these plants. Um, and it just, I think I know why it's happening. I think people are very devoted to scripture and um, you know what has been there for their ancestral narrative and they can't get beyond that. Um, it's, it's tough, it's tough. But I think with the youth, the, the Jane youths totally get it. I mean, they have, I think, the, so the biggest one in America is called Jaina, and um, all of their events are vegan. They have a very plant-based philosophy. They completely understand the hypocrisy in that. So things will start to change. Um, I think and, that's an amazing thing. Yeah, I think that's an amazing application of it in the modern day, and it shows that the real understanding can be drawn out in the now, because conditions are different. You didn't have mass animal farms uh, a thousand years ago and you know the conditions have to be applied to what is happening now uh in that way would, oh. yeah mm. no, go ahead yeah i would say that even if you didn't have those mass factory farms back then from a sheer um perspective of taking something from a, a life like milk e even if it was done in this this one water buffalo on the farm i still feel that's wrong i don't think we should decide what to do with her milk ever um, sure. you know, but that may be viewed as an extremist view. I, I don't think so. I think that maybe we didn't have it right 
in the beginning. We didn't have the philosophy correct. We weren't thinking about that component of violence or ahimsa as Jains who justified ghee from what, that one water buffalo on a farm. I don't think that was right either. <laughs> I, I mean, I think even you know Gandhi in uh, the early 1920s. Uh, I, I read extensively some of his work and on this subject, and he says that there's nothing that I am convinced about more than the fact that we shouldn't really be consuming animal products. And and he gave up dairy milk um, due to the fact that you know probably veganism was not a thing at that time, and he was one of the you know very very few people. I think personally, he was very scared about his own health um, at right. certain points when he fell sick and the doctors were like urging him saying, hey, you need to have a, a little bit of goat milk at least or, or something. That was the one thing that he feels that he, you know, broke his rules or, or his vows on. He vowed to be, uh, to not consume dairy and then, you know, took goat milk and he felt that, you know, that was in his autobiography, the thing that he cheated himself on because of the you know, the pressure of doctors and the pressure of everyone around him, he felt, look, I, I could potentially die if I continue this. And, you know, he had that moment. But I think for sure, if he was around today, then, you know, he would have that uh, confidence of uh, data and science and, and support of the world to kind of lean that way. So I think he actually applied himself to be vegan uh, yeah. and, and largely fruitarian, you know, largely, you know, based on fruits and nuts as the core and then vegetables. And then, you know, yeah. uh, and his uh, philosophy around. of um, boycotting, right? Like boy, boycotting all that you don't agree with, right? Like, I mean, it's essentially as vegans and plant-based people, we're all boycotting something that is so cruel. Um, so yeah, he, phenomenal person. And um, yeah, and I think he, he was raised with a lot of Jain philosophy as well. So from his mom. Absolutely, I think uh, one of the teachers that most, uh, uh, inspired him. Uh, Ranchenbai was a, uh, a Jain philosopher. I think he was a jeweler who sat and you know taught him a lot of spiritual um, subjects. And and look, to be honest, for me, Jainism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Buddhism—they all, you know, the heart is the same. Uh, whether it's yeah. you know, it's it's all empty or it's all full. I, I think you know, at the core of the philosophy, it's love uh, for all beings and the removal right. of suffering. I find. That there is one goal to all of these tradition, and that is the removal of suffering or the end of suffering. That's the goal. Moksha or liberation is the end of suffering. And therefore, right. if we have people who are suffering in front of us now or animals who are suffering, then we should do that work now as a spiritual um, mission as well as a, a social mission. Uh, right. I think yep. it, it shows that karma yoga is that. Uh, yes. action now and serving serving society yes and the other common thing among all of the dharmic philosophies and cultures is that we know how to do it we don't have the same obstacles of like what would we eat <laughs> on a plant-based diet we know how mm -hmm. to do it so um there's really no excuse <laughs> well one of the uh, uh, and i know we're gonna uh, end up in a minute it's been amazing talking to you about this area and i'm sure a lot of the people that we've been sharing the Go Plant-Based campaign um, too over the last few months will take a lot of inspiration from, from what you've been saying. We're trying to get to uh, 500 people who take a personal pledge to go vegan, go plant-based, take that, um, that work. And, and we're going to be cycling to Glasgow. Um, it's the same distance that Gandhi walked from Sabarmati Ashram to Dandi Beach to protest and boycott the salt laws of right. the British uh, rule, which was 7,000% tax on salt. Today, we feel that, you know, the big stand is for the environment, like we are in a critical situation. A lot of things being discussed, transport, um, biofuel, like should we um, change our fuel uh, usage? But animal agriculture is really being left out. It's the elephant in the room, so to speak. And we wanted to do this cycle ride to Glasgow to make that stand for and promote plant-based diets and feed everybody who comes to, to Glasgow, 10,000 people, a plant-based meal uh, so that they can understand that. What's your final thoughts on you know, going plant-based and taking a pledge as yeah. a direct, uh, uh, it's kind of boycotting me 
to take yeah. that pledge. So, so what's your final thoughts on, on that? Yeah, no, and I think what you're doing is wonderful and you'll be, it's, it's great. You'll, you'll embrace quite a few people. Um, I guess my final message would be always lead your life with compassion in everything you do. If that means compassion for your personal health or compassion for the world we live in or compassion for innocent animals, the only way to do it is to ditch big ag, ditch the meat, ditch the dairy and embrace this compassionate just food system of plant-based living. Um, you know, I think as, as Indians, it's easy to do this with all the spices, you know, how to work lentils and veggies and, and think about your personal karma. Think about how much you will generate just by your food that you eat three times a day. And always remember that nothing wants to die. Nothing wants to die. Everything wants to live on this planet. So those are my, and raise your children vegetarian or vegan because it's much easier to stick with that than to give up something you've eaten your whole life. Um, so those are my messages and good luck. And I look forward to seeing and supporting Go, uh, Go Dharmic. Really appreciate everything you've said and, and it's been a real pleasure talking to you. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you, thank you. Take, Take care. Bye-bye. Namaste. Bye. Namaste.